Welcome to Maxwell Institute Conversations, special videocast episodes of the Maxwell Institute podcast, hosted by Terrell Givens and created in collaboration with Faith Matters Foundation. You can watch this episode in your podcast app, or if you're on the run, listen to the audio version. In this episode, Terrell Givens is joined by Kate Holbrook, Managing Historian for Women's History for The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Over the past several years, she's been working on some of the most fascinating projects about LDS history, including the books At the Pulpit and The First Fifty Years of Relief Society. Holbrook says many Mormons have embraced this burst of insight into the history of women in the church. As people have read both The First Fifty Years of Relief Society and At the Pulpit, a little surprised at how meaningful it's been to women of my mother's generation. You know, they'd never pick up a volume of the Joseph Smith papers or some other great church right, history book, right. but this they'll stay up past midnight reading, so hungry for it, so hungry to hear about the experiences that are, feel more familiar and more relatable to them. It's Terrell Givens speaking with Kate Holbrook of the LDS Church History Department on this episode of Maxwell Institute Conversations. Hello and welcome to another installment of Conversations with Terrell Givens, sponsored by the Faith Matters Foundation. Uh, This is a podcast series devoted to exploring the experience of lived Mormonism as a catalyst to the abundant life and to the public good. And my guest today is Kate Holbrook. And we're delighted to have you with us for this next hour. Thank you for coming, Kate. So glad to be here. I'd like to start off by asking a question that may strike some people as rather morbid, but it seems to me the best way to get to the, the heart of who you are or, who, or, or how you may be remembered. And that is if, if, you, were, if you were to overhear your obituary read in the, in the following days, what, um, what points would probably be made? What are the sal- salient features of your life as they'd be remembered up to this point. I've written some books in Mormon women's history that I feel have been good contributions there. I think I'll be remembered generally through favorite recipes that have come from me. I've decided (laughs) that's a maybe in some ways richer and more lasting visceral experience that people will have of my having been on this earth. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Um, can you think of anything that you would like to be remembered and noted for that maybe might have escaped uh, public notice or even family notice up to this point? Terrell. <laughs> I, I think this is a difference between um, men and, and women, as I think men tend to think about these things more than, than women do, and this isn't something that Well, that's I, what Fiona tells me, that I'm always looking to the about future or the past, and she says, I'm too busy living in the now. <laughs> And, and questions of legacy. Uh, yeah. I, I don't. That's a male thing. Okay, well, let's yeah. go on to another question okay. then. Let me ask you this. Um, one of my favorite poems from William Wordsworth comes from the prelude, and he refers to spots of time. There are in our existence spots of time, he says, that have a particular renovating virtue, that are moments in which a, a window kind of opens into the future of our lives, and we take a particular course or direction as a result of some seminal experience or influence. Mm -hmm. If you had to think of a couple of those moments in your life that that gave you direction or purpose uh, or meaning, can you think of a couple of shaping moments you could share? Mm -hmm. One, uh, I was four years old. My great-grandpa bought some land in the Uintas, and my grandfather spent his summers growing up on that land. And then just before I was born, he built a house that I share with my cousins. And one night, he and I were the only two at the cabin, and his back went out, and he was in excruciating pain, and he waited just until the sun came up, and he dragged himself out into the hall, and he called for me, and he said, you need to go get your aunt. And I was a very, I'm still imaginative, very imaginative child. So to go through the woods about the length of a block to get my aunt. And you're four years old. My great aunt, and I was four, to help him was terrifying to me. And I, and I remember feeling quite loved. I think he even told me to take a jacket <laughs> in his, all his impaired condition. And I ran, and the whole time I just, I prayed. 
and I ran so fast, as fast as my little legs could go, and prayed, and then reached my great aunt, his sister, and then everything was okay. They were taking care of me. People were dispatched to take care of him. But I think as scary as that moment was for me, it gave me a real sense that I can do things that are scary, that God will be by my side. No kidnappers or bears or lions came out of the woods, which is what I was afraid of. Uh, And that I can do things on my own, I think, came out of that experience. So, so do you see the end of that kind of trajectory is related to where you are now? I, I should have introduced you uh, this way at the very beginning, but you are the, 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 your title is actually Managing Historian, right? Of Women's History at the Church mm-hmm. Historical Department. I, I think my whole, that background, I was an only child. My grandfather died not long afterward. I ended up growing up with my mother and grandmother in Provo, Utah. And an only child... And somebody without a father and a grandfather was unusual there. Right. And wherever I've been, I've been a little bit unusual. Uh, So at Divinity School, I was not the only Latter-day Saint to attend Harvard Divinity School, but I was still unusual. And I was accustomed to being unusual. And so it felt felt comfortable to me. It felt like something I could could do. And I've learned to span different worlds and, and have my feet in different kind of social spaces, which I think right. comes in really handy in my current job where I'm straddling uh, the institutional church and the world and priorities there and the academic world of history and religious studies and the priorities there. Right. So your background was pretty firmly entrenched in the Latter-day Saint tradition, was it? Yes, on both sides back to... Parley P. Pratt, whom you know. <laughs> yes, yeah, I spent and, some time and, with him. And, and other founders. Good. Uh, so at what point did you consider yourself to be um, kind of authentically Mormon in your own right? Does that make sense? Yeah. I, I think it was actually that moment Going back that was far. important. I, I know everybody has a different approach to faith and a different journey with faith. And f- in my life, faith was, n- it was a gift. I knew there was a Father in Heaven that was listening to those prayers as I ran along that woodland path. So you haven't been struggling with the uh, the faith challenges that seem so endemic in our culture today. No, and I also also growing up with a single mother at a time where it, it was hard to be a divorced woman in the church. It was it was hard to attend church on fast Sunday when people would say how grateful they were for their families and their supportive spouses, and and she would. Acutely, my mother would acutely feel the loss that she didn't have those things. Yeah, help help me to be attuned to the fact that as a people and as a church culture, we're we're growing and maturing and learning, and it's a, it's okay to notice things that aren't always working ideally. Did, did she feel supported by the wards that you were a part of? It depended on who, it depended on who the bishop was and and who the Relief Society president was, and just how people treated her. And it also depends on time. I think that's true of everybody. Right. When there's a change, I think it takes five years to really settle into a new congregation. So. Do you think in, this, in, in the course of, of your life as you've lived it so far, have you seen progress, improvement in our sensitivity to those who are not uh, a part of conventional families as we're used to defining them? I have, even just over the pulpit. In general conferences, it, when a little bit is said, we know that not everybody's family looks like this, or we, we can define family in, in different ways. Right. That, that's more than happened when I was growing up. I still think we there's room for us to grow. Right, right. Yeah. Good. Well, Kate, you're a phenomenal historian. You've done some tremendously important work that I think uh, many, many people in the church are familiar with and uh, have appreciated. Uh, the first 50 years of Relief Society, you were one of the editors of that massive volume. And uh, the kind of the, the, the kind of female um, journal of discourses called At the Pulpit. Mm-hmm. So, can you talk a little bit about what sets you on that particular path? That uh, when did you first feel a flowering of your interest in history and of women's history in particular? I, th- I attended BYU as an English major and a Russian major during the 1990s. Um, and so, what I learned being there during the 90s is that there's something dangerous about studying women's history or women's theology, and I decided I wouldn't do it. And uh, so, so, what, so explain that. Uh, I didn't want to be excommunicated. 
Okay. <laughs> I really valued my membership in the church. I still do. So what period of time was this, just for those who don't remember? Oh, so I was there 90 to 94. Cecilia Conchar far left BYU. Right. Well, uh, actually, just, just after I was there. Um, and the September 6th uh, was in, what year was that? 93? I think so. I, yes, I was a missionary while it happened. Okay. So, so I was gone. But so you got a little gun I had a little se- sense of it, yeah. So I went to Harvard Divinity School and studied world religion. And then I decided to go to Boston University and, and study religion and literature. But always I kept, even the classes, I t- ostensibly I was studying world religions, but I te- kept taking classes on like, women in international development. You know, it was always this, what, what's the world like for women? What's religious experience like for women? Um, how do I understand that that better? Right. And so finally, when it came time to choose a dissertation topic, I thought, if I'm going to write this thing, I'm going to write about something I love. And my abiding intellectual interests are women, religion, and food. So I figured out a way to do that. So what was your dissertation title? Radical Food, <laughs> <laughs> Latter-day Saint, and Nation of Islam Culinary Ideologies. Good. Mm. Can you talk to us a little bit about how we got to where we are today in terms of the place of women's history and women's history initiatives in the Church Historical Department? When did that turn toward women's history occur? Can you point to a particular moment or era when that was noticeable? Well, uh I don't want to leave out any names. There were a few women who carried on in what had made me frightened and think, well, I I don't want to study Mormon women's history. They just carried on quietly doing work. Cherry Silver is one that maybe people haven't heard of, but has made tremendous, uh, been a tremendous support and helped to keep other people going and doing this this work. And she's been working on Emmeline Wells' diaries for for right. a couple of decades, and is finishing that up soon. Um, and then Jill Mulvey Durr, we know Carol Cornwall Madsen, we know Maureen Ersenbach Beecher, and those women were mentored as well by Leonard Arrington. So he was interested himself in Mormon women's history, and he looked for other people with a similar interest that he could encourage. At the same time, women in Boston, who formed the Exponent Two group, were also starting to discover the riches of Mormon women's history. So kind of these two, and they did communicate, but there were these two satellites of people starting to think about these things and research these things right. and discover. Well, you talk about the, the, the church, um, if not resistance to at least less than a welcoming environment that was provided for some of the women's history initiatives early on. And mm-hmm. yet now we see that the church has kind of gone full throttle mm-hmm. in sponsoring and encouraging these kind of developments. Uh, what changed, do you think? I think there have been, I think there isn't a, a trajectory like this. I think there have just, it's been more like this. And these these women and Arrington um, made a really terrific foundation. And then when I moved to Utah, it was, it was around the time I was writing my dissertation prospectus. So I started a writing group and Jill Mulvader was in the writing group. And one day she came to writing group and she said, I'm going to retire. And in order to replace me, they have agreed to replace me with somebody who will specifically do women's history instead of just replacing me with another historian so that this women's history focus won't be lost. So were you the first hire designated as a woman's historian? Yeah. So that was, I applied for the job. I just thought, oh, there's my destiny. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, applied for the job. And, have been doing and how long ago was that? Six years ago. And are there other women who have been hired to, to exclusively do or to focus on women's history? Yes, right. So Jenny Reeder works on our web team, and she focuses on women's history in that capacity. And then Lisa Tate is on the women's history team, and she and I are working on a history of the Young Women Organization right now together. I want to talk to you a little bit about something that you said in remarks that you gave at uh, the commemorative symposium for Richard Bushman where you talked about um, stories and how they matter. And one thing in particular that you referenced in that talk was the idea that uh, we ourselves are in some ways saved by our dead. We always think of the reciprocal relationship that we have to save our dead. Mm -hmm. But you reversed that equation. Can you talk a little bit about what you meant by that? It doesn't make sense to me that the only reason that 
that Latter-day Saints are such assiduous record keepers is so that we can do temple work for the dead. It's important, but it doesn't seem to me to be anything near the complete picture. But those records that the dead have left behind, they have the real power to save, save us, to help us be more resilient, to give us vision, to give us hope. You see people who really are interested in family history People who may have, you know, spent their careers working for ZCMI or something not, not related to history. But when they start doing family history, they discover this just absolute passion and the sense of being led in small, everyday ways by the, by the hand of God. Uh, so that, that's also my experience working in my office studying church right. history. Is right. This real thinning of, of the world's. Oh. Uh, yeah. between the living and the dead. The um, it, I'm reminded of a, of a wonderful passage that comes from Horace. Um, almost 2,000 years ago, he said, Many heroes there were before Agamemnon, for they are all unweepable and consigned to the long night of oblivion because they had no sacred bards. Mm -hmm. So there's this sense that uh, in many ways there's a sacred task related to the recuperation of and preservation of, uh, in many cases, the, the simple, unremarkable lives by which we have always been surrounded. Um, have you felt some of that? Have you felt that there's a, it, it's not just a professional calling, but there's a, a kind of sacred vocational calling you feel as well? Absolutely. And I feel it when I speak about the, the books that I've worked on. I, I feel... I, I, one thing to mention is that I think it's not just that unremarkable lives have not been studied. I think when it's women's lives, remarkable lives have also not been right. studied. Good, good correction. And, and, and to begin this process of preserving and telling stories, we, we, do, we do look at the everyday lives, but we also have focused on women who were really well-known while they lived, made tremendous contributions to both the institution of the church and the thinking and believing the theology of the church. Uh, we, we want to make sure people <laughs> yeah. see their contributions as well. In terms of our institutional support for an encouragement for uh, balancing the scales and, and bringing the stories of women um, up to a par with those of men. Are we at a good place yet? Is there is there more to be done? There's a there's a lot more to be done. The church, church history, our understanding of church history, really changes when we look more carefully at what women leaders and everyday women were doing. And and we're working in the history department on that. We're working, thinking how to put a few more women's experiences even into the Joseph Smith papers, which are so male centric right. because we. You know, this is a church about wholeness. It yeah. really is, yeah. and co and cooperation between different kinds of people. And and in our history, we've neglected. Now, have you been involved at all with the new church history project that has been announced? Uh, no, per, I got to read a draft here and there of different things, but and do you get the sense that there's more weaving of women's stories into that narrative? From what I've read, yes. And and I know there was certainly an intention, a concerted effort to bring to women's stories in. And it's difficult. If that's not the way you're used to writing history, and if that's not the way other stories have been written, then then it's hard. That's yeah. another reason the stories are neglected is because yeah. they're harder to find. And it's a little bit trickier to figure out what to do with them. You have to expand the way you think about what your task is as right. a historian. right. Could we segue now to talk a little bit about kind of where your personal experience as a woman of faith and uh, the kind of institutional um, theology uh, of women intersect? And tell me, uh, are you happy with your status as a woman in the in the restored church? <laughs> that was a pregnant pause. <laughs> yeah, well, that's a big question. <laughs> I am happy with my status as a woman in the restored church. I think the church is learning and, and making an effort to to figure out how better to care for its female members. Yeah, and, yeah. and not just female members. There are different kinds of members that we need to think right. how to better nourish. Uh, 
Well, let's let's talk about a couple of forms of discontent yeah. as as they exist. There are some women that, that uh, find the legacy of, of polygamy very painful mm -hmm. and the effect of continuation of that practice uh, through temple work, mm -hmm. um, deeply hurtful and, and, and hard to reconcile. Um, there are women that are unhappy with a male priesthood mm -hmm. and a church administered uniquely by males and, and the paucity of forums and avenues for women's voices to be heard. How have you negotiated those kinds of challenges and, and uh, remaining true and relatively happy as a, as a, as a member? Uh, in, in general, I think this, this thing, meaning the church, that has brought so much meaning and beauty to my life that calls me to be concerned about those outside my immediate circle and that has facilitated a relationship with my Father in Heaven and with my Savior in remarkable ways. I would never uh, give that up just because there was one concern um, that was a real concern. Right. I, right. Just if, if you weigh those, I think, well, I'm, gonna, <laughs> I'm not going to give all of this away just because of one, one concern. But I don't want to downplay, I know how painful those concerns can, can be for people, and I don't want to be dismissive of that. I have a lot of compassion for that. I, I'm not sure why uh, why I haven't felt in my own life that they needed to to derail or take more of my, my attention. I, I think study helps. I think it was a great help to, to spend a couple of years studying other religious traditions and right. to see there's right. not a way of worshiping out there that is really fantastic for women. This is, you know, I, I, the, the, what we have as Mormon women in our theology, in our ideology of heavenly parents, in all of the responsibilities that are given to women, in having an unmediated relationship to God through the Holy Ghost— these are these are ext extraordinary for for women and and I don't want us in in thinking about how to improve I don't want us to lose sight of aspects of this church that are so good for for women and and for men right. down to learning to give a talk when you're in primary I mean down to very practical matters there's lofty theological matters and there are these everyday things you learn growing up in this church that are that are a great right. gift um, and I, 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 I think that heaven is, from what I, I know, what I feel I know about God and about Jesus, and I don't know that much about Heavenly Mother, I have a little sense, there's love, there's beauty, and there's mercy there. So I, I am not personally as concerned with what, marital relationships will look like in the afterlife because those beings are overseeing it. So it seems to me it will be good, and it seems to me we're finite creatures. Who, and sometimes that has to be enough. There, there's a lot beyond what we can imagine, living in this fallen world among fallen people, as we do. Yeah. Yeah. Let me ask you a question about the history of the Relief Society, and, and I'll explain why I'm asking the question, why I'm asking it the way I am. My question is whether your immersion in the, in the history of the LDS Relief Society has, has been equal parts painful and inspiring. And what I mean by that is the more one recovers the original context and setting of the Relief Society and, and Joseph's original statements at the time of the organization to the Relief mm -hmm. Society, the more it seems apparent that he, he envisioned the Relief Society in terms of a more collaborative relationship with a male priesthood, uh, it certainly had a greater degree of autonomy and uh, a greater abundance of spiritual gifts and uh, authority to even administer ordinances uh, of healing and, mm -hmm. and kindred things. So there's certainly a sense of loss that I think one experiences immersed in that past. But there's also, it would seem to me, a kind of sense of jubilation when one recognizes the, 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 the greatness and the intrepidity and the, and the, the, the kind of the, the proactive uh, nature of the women leaders that you saw 
uh, emerging at that time in history and the kind of the intellectual strength, the their their participation in nat- national fora. Um, we just heard a paper delivered last week at a symposium talking about the women's peace movement that was inaugurated by LDS women in World War One, the time mm-hmm. of World War One. Uh, some of the writings and the women's exponent, the original, were just incredible. I mean, they're articulate, they're impassioned, they're 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 brilliant. So, how do you how do you balance kind of those two experiences of becoming more familiar with the past? Uh, I, f- I feel it, the, what you have just described explains why a lot of our historians have focused on 19th century, early 20th century Mormon women's history. But the the downside of that is that we aren't as aware of the fantastic thinking and energy and uh, these kinds of contributions of women in the 20th century, and they, they are s- still there. But I don't want to say that there isn't a difference between a time when a woman was able to say, I had this terrific idea, she's, say, the General Relief Society president, and she goes and she talks with the president of the church about it. That's certainly different than yeah. now when she goes and talks to somebody in the presiding bishopric. and It has to go through several levels to even get to the right. president. So, so, so there is, there is a lot, there is a loss, and there's a difference. So then, instead of going with the culture, we're going against the culture. But now the culture's over here, right? <laughs> and and we're over here, right? So, I want to run by <clears throat> another idea by you, and you obviously much more versed in, in women's history in the church than I am. But this is an impression that I had as I was looking at the history of of polygamy and its demise in the late 19th century. And initially, all of the church's apologists and defenders of polygamy are, are the men, right? Beginning especially in 1852 with Orson Pratt announcing it, and then he writes extensively in The Seer, uh, justifying it. And, and generally it's justified on the grounds of raising up seed, <clears throat> it's being a higher law. Um, and then there comes a point when national opposition reaches a kind of fever pitch that the men kind of turn the work over to the women of defending mm-hmm. the, 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 the practice. And tell me if I'm wrong, but it, it seemed to me that, that once the women get the microphone, they speak a very different language about plural marriage. And they're no longer celebrating it as this, this, this great higher law and, 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 and its, its utility as a way of raising up, proliferating posterity. It's an Abrahamic test. And, and some of them are quite outspoken about saying, well, Abrahamic tests aren't something that we hope will be eternally perpetuated <laughs> by, <laughs> by definition. It's a furnace that we, we go through. And so it seems to me a, a wonderful moment. It kind of reminds one of the French Revolution, right, where you wouldn't have had a revolution if the king hadn't actually convened the estates together. And once you give them the microphone, <laughs> then you can't control the discourse. <laughs> and is there something similar that happened there? Did it kind of unleash a, a certain kind of power and energy when women were actually given their own voice in this issue? You know, I, I would just change. They weren't given their own voice. They came up with the idea to have these meetings. I'm so it wasn't with, delegated. They, it wasn't delegated. They, they said, we it. want to have this mass indignation meeting. We are, gonna, we are going to do this. And, and then at these meetings, they spoke from the heart about how they understood plural marriage and why it mattered to them. And, and why they should be able to live according to the dictates of their conscience. So right. and I don't see, now I would like to go back and study this, I don't see quite as many differences as, as you've just suggested. There some between the way they described it and the way men described it, but they were also used to hearing the way men were describing it. So I think that does come through still yeah. in, their, in their discourses. I don't see them wishing for the end when they're defending it is maybe the Abrahamic explanation suggests. I see them, there was a lot of real mourning uh, with the manifesto and the follow-up to the manifesto as, as they heard that this principle that they'd been sacrificing for that was central to how they understood their faith community was no longer going to be practiced. Right. There were mixed, of course, reactions, but there was... That included real mourning about no longer participating in, in plural marriage. 
so for some of them, some they of mourned. them really, really loved, yeah. loved at least the ideal of it. Yeah. yeah. Now you have three daughters. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, how do you think their future in the church will be different than your experience as a woman? How do you hope it will be? Yeah. I think we're already more sensitive and we'll be increasingly more sensitive to creating... It's just, it's not only more spaces for women, it's more visibility to the contributions women are already making. Uh, I hope that there will be more women on governing councils as they get older. That's, right. that's in my mind, the next frontier. I, in my research, I see that the collaboration during the era of MIA, so the young men and the young women, was a real time when male leaders and female leaders were, were getting together and working together and solving things together. And they even, the presidents of the different organizations took turns conducting and presiding at the meetings. So it wasn't even really? always the priesthood leader who was conducting the meeting. And, and it, it would be good for us to look back at that and, and see what we can learn from, from that. Right. From that time. I, and my daughters, the, I remember when the, Somebody was being confirmed in sacrament meeting, and my youngest, who was three, stood up on the bench during the prayer and said, how come there are no girls in there? <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to ask that question. I was going to ask, uh, are, your, are your daughters asking any difficult questions yet? I shushed her then because it was the middle of an ordinance. Um, but we do, <laughs> we, we don't try to create the questions <clears throat> for them. We wanted them to have space to see the beauty and all of the things that are functioning really well without us taking something that we think is complicated and bringing it to them on a platter when they're, they're maybe too young to deal with it. But as, certain, as soon as they have a question, and it doesn't matter how old they are, when they have a question, we, we treat them a little bit like an adult. We say, this, right. well, this is how we understand it. This is how other people explain it and understand it. Um, does either of these make sense to you? Does neither of them make sense to you? Um, we, we want them to feel that my own experience with Mormon history is that there's nothing to be afraid of. It's a history of people working hard to find God that I find tremendously inspiring. Even when they screw up, there's still so much to learn, to learn from that. And, and I don't, I hope my children don't feel that there, there's anything out there, including people who, including people of other faiths or people of no faith, there's nothing out there to be afraid of. There are just things to try to gently understand and ask questions about and, and live with and, right. and, and, and ask. I think that's, the, that's the theme for young people this year has been a ask. I think what a terrific, what it, a terrific it's, thing. Um, <clears throat> it seems to me that we have gone through a, a cultural shift more profound than some of us recognize that I think was typified by Elder Ballard's talk that he gave to, to the CES folks a few years ago mm -hmm. when he said that the time is past when it was appropriate to answer a question with a testimony and that now we have to, to dignify the question by giving it a real answer. And if we don't know, then we need to find somebody who can. So did that hearten you to hear that there has been a kind of officially proclaimed space now in the church for Mormon historians to serve an important spiritual function, which is to shore up the foundations of faith by providing more cogent answers to some of those questions that people are asking. Mm -hmm. And in a more open process, like we say, this is our best effort to find an answer to this. And it and we feel it's complete or it's incomplete. It's our best effort. We'll, we'll continue to work on this. We'll continue to try to find right. uh, what we can. And, and we're, not worried. we're not worried about it. You yeah. know? Uh, Elder Ballard is also the one that, since at least the 90s, has been talking about councils. councils. Right. Uh, I, right. uh, <laughs> that, that man is... So his name is well-loved in yes. your circles. <laughs> Had a grand vision about many things for a long yeah. time. Yeah. It's also important that the Gospel Doctrine Manual, the introduction now, 
re remember back when you were only supposed to teach from the manual? Right. And now it says in the manual the church has been preparing a lot of extra resources to help us understand the the gospel. And then there are links throughout the lessons online that link to what the history department is right. is producing. Right. And at the pulpit. Um, the collection of women's discourses. Is, is that one of the sources? It's being translated into Spanish and Portuguese now, which is requisite for it to be one of the sources. And then it will be part of the Gospel Library app. True. So we're very excited about that because we know that a lot of people are well-intentioned and want to include more women's stories and quote more women. Uh, but life is people get busy, they get overwhelmed, and so they go with what's easy and with what's familiar. So that book, now there's no, now that book can be easy and familiar and right yeah. there on your on your phone or your iPad or whatever it is you use. Yeah. So. It's hard to see the historical landscape when we're down in the valley. And <clears throat> we often like to think that we're part of a historic moment. Um, but do you think uh, 20 or 50 years from now, the period that you're living through is is going to be deemed a period of particular importance in terms of transition or paradigm shifts from your perspective, what you'd, you've experienced from the inside? There certainly have been shifts while I've, well, I've just in the past six years while I've been in, in my job, but shifts that are important to <clears throat> me, like women being on the priesthood and temple and missionary committees, the high, except for the Quorum of the Twelve, the highest committees of the church, women's leaders' pictures being in the center of the ensign after the conference issue, some of some of these things I think have been very important. On the other hand, as I look at church history, there are times when when a lot of uh, a lot of more appreciation of women and their contributions and and more in, independence to to women or more w collaboration of women and men working together has happened. And then there are other times when so that you're telling me you don't have this Peter optimistic Dahl. view of history. Well, it's I, not this I, continual. I, I have an optimistic ascent. view, a very optimistic and hopeful view. Um, but I I don't. And I would like to just think that this then won't be seen as too remarkable because <clears> so much. No, progress is quite the right word, but so so many things will happen in the future that they'll think we were still pretty backward here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let me ask you a little bit about discipleship. Um, this particular um, session is one of a series that we're doing called The Ways of Discipleship. And uh, a question I have, you know, we, we joked a little bit at the beginning about the fact that there are male ways and female ways of, of thinking about different things mm. and experiencing life, perhaps. Um, how is discipleship gendered? That's a very vague general question, maybe. But could you talk a little bit about that um, and how your immersion in a sea of women's voices has conditioned, shaped, or modulated your own discipleship, your ways of relating to God and, and uh, living your faith? Has it had a tangible effect? It's a terrific <clears throat> question. And... I just we I think we both know that when you make a generalization, it's by definition not true because there will always be exceptions to the generalization. Um, so, so I just want to be clear that I'm aware <laughs> <Okay>. of that. <laughs> <clears throat> but it does seem to me very important that there are voices out there to which you feel a kinship. We experience, you know, we have our favorite members of the Quorum of the Twelve that when they speak, it feels like it particularly resonates with us. And that that's just with male leaders. Um, there are also different ways of seeing the gospel that, that women leaders have that I think would also resonate with different male church members, right. but really resonate with female church members who, who just ha have that femaleness in common along a spectrum, but they, they have it in common. And I've found, as people have read both the first 50 years of Relief Society and at the pulpit, uh, I've been a little surprised at how meaningful it's been to women of my mother's generation. I love the books, but I didn't realize how somebody who doesn't usually read, you know, they'd never pick up a volume of the Joseph Smith papers or some other great church right, history book, right. but this they'll stay up past midnight 
reading, so hungry for it, so hungry to hear about the experiences that are, feel more familiar and more relatable to them. Yeah, I think you've quoted elsewhere the, the famous passage from, or pretend you did if you didn't, <laughs> from uh, the movie Shadowlands, where C.S. Lewis is depicted as saying, we read to know that we are not alone. Right. <clears throat> and I know that in, in my devotional life and that of my wife, Fiona, for both of us, the idea of the invisible church looms large. I mean, it's, it's huge for us. This belief that there is a community of those who have loved God in every age and have borne eloquent testimony with words or with their lives to their discipleship. And we feel connected to them often when we come across their writings and their testimonies and their words. And it seems that what you are doing is you are in many ways doubling the repertoire yeah. of resources available to find those kindred voices. And uh, I just want to say I think that's a very beautiful thing, and a very beautiful contribution Thank you. that you're making. Um, but any other reflections on the unique challenges that women find to be disciples in the modern church? This is a, a time in the world, well, not the whole world, the Western world, when if you're a particularly ambitious person, woman, there are places to go out and realize your ambition. And it wasn't, in the, in the 19th century, church was the way that an ambitious woman could really find a cause she believed in and make the most of it. And uh, now, yes, you do create what you can and want to at church. And I hope people, I hope people do. Uh, but there are also all of these opportunities that are still, you know, spirit-driven, that are, that are still related to the cause of Jesus. Uh, but you might be realizing them through your law practice or um, through a, a, as a teacher or a banker. And that's less familiar to me. Right. <laughs> Jesus is, well, no, you do. I mean, to... to to help bring greater economic or educational resources to people in less developed countries. I mean, there, in, in, in every field, there's, there's a way uh, to and, be, be a real disciple. And have we arrived at a point, do you think, in church culture where women like yourself can feel welcomed into any environment where they want to make their contribution? Um. I, I, in some ways, I'm the right person to ask, and sometimes I'm not, because maybe because I'm an optimist, I just feel that I've been really, the bishops I've had in my life have just been really loving, wonderful people. They've even created positions in the in the ward to try to figure out more ways for women to participate. I was a, a not an executive secretary, but kept the appointments and things for one bishop, and in one I was the head of the liturgy committee, so would help, uh, well, I would choose and in consultation with the bishopric who would be speaking at church and what they would speak about, right. that just the in innovative thinkers. So, and in our Salt Lake City ward right now, I feel that people are just full of love and acceptance for whatever's on my mind and even whatever's on my husband's mind, <laughs> which is, so tends to be a little more dramatic than... So you've had a good experience as a professional historian in the church. Really good. And even as a person, I didn't change my last name when I was married. And for some people, that's foreign. But they certainly, there, there has, well, I've good. always felt a lot of acceptance. And I, I know that's not the case for, I know that's not the case for everyone. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, and I think sometimes that's a problem. Sometimes I think the problem is that... Uh, my children, I think, felt that they were caught in that moment of paradigm shift a little bit. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, maybe, maybe it had already passed and they didn't recognize it, but I have three daughters as well. Mm -hmm. And I know that some of them were a little anxious about, well, it's, it's as if we suddenly have these options that weren't here before. And I can be a mother and pursue a PhD and be a professional. Um, and so in some cases, um, there can be a burden of freedom that you're suddenly exposed to, right? Whereas before there was a, a kind of, 
more limited set of options available or, or expected of you. And uh, so it's, it's a great moment, but I think it can be a little bit disconcerting too. Would you agree? That yes, and it's disconcerting for women outside of the church too. As well. I, we were resident tutors, which is a fancy name for dorm parents at, at Harvard College for five years. And, and I'd hear female students studying there, which I think that's why I mentioned the place that matters, saying, I think um, I'm not going to work after I have children. Because they, maybe they'd had mothers who had worked, and maybe they, right. it, we're still working this out. I mean, as a society, we work too much. My own view is we need to everybody work a little less as a society and spend a little more time with our our children. But uh, yeah. it, it, it's something that I think everybody is is grappling with, and it's unclear how to make it work. And it's and it's also unclear sometimes how to really keep supporting those women who decide full-time parenting is what they want, the contributions they make to their communities. I see, I see this. I, I go to, I have a full-time job and I don't sign up for extra PTA responsibilities. Mm. And I, I still try to cook for, you know, you still try to find how you can contribute to, to your neighborhood and your immediate community. But I, I don't do half what the women who right. don't have jobs do. And then to have them feel like second class citizens because they don't get to right. write books and have people think they're cool because they write books. It's, yeah. it's unfair. So what advice do you have for young women or people in general who, who would love to pursue the kind of life you're pursuing professionally? What do you, you must be asked that from time to time, right? How do I get to do what you're doing? Yeah. And just like with anything, I, I worked with a woman, Swanee Hunt, who was a, she inherited billions of dollars from the oil industry, and she was Clinton's secretary to um, Austria when war was breaking out in the Balkans. And uh, she, she said, you know, whatever you plan, it's fine if you want to be a planner. <laughs> it's not where you're going to going to end up and that's true for men as well as as for women I, I, my own life i i've done what felt right and what i wanted to do i think it's good to think about what you want also i in my own life that's the way the spirit helps communicate with me it's what do i want what do i feel excited about and then at the place you are the time you're there you pursue that and you try to make the most of it. Yeah. And, and when you're in a place where you don't know what you want and, and it's not clear how to get out, you, you know that's not forever. And you think about what can I, I really think asking the question, what can I contribute now where I am? is such a much more helpful question than um, one that's a little more focused on self. Can you think of a moment when, when you had a, a a deeply moving, or compelling confirmation that you had made the right choice to be making the contribution where you are? Well, my, it was, I didn't know what I wanted to be when I grew up. I went to divinity school because when you're there, you can take courses all over the university. And then I taught, one of my professors invited me to teach with them. So for two years, we created and taught these really popular courses. So then I thought, and I was having miscarriages. So I thought, well, I guess I'll, I guess I'll get a PhD. And it was when I was accepted to my PhD program that I finally got pregnant. <laughs> that was how God was maybe working with me to get me to do this thing. So it was that kind of the convergence of circumstances. Maybe that... I was a little reluctant <clears throat> in my, in my, I was alive. I was a teen when President Benson gave his To the Mothers in Zion speech and it made a big impression and it took yeah. a while for me to see through it. But when I uh, was offered my current job, and accepted it, it felt so clear to me that this was the right thing. And I think I needed that clarity because I, I worried that it was a full-time job. And I had tried to ask whether we could make it a part-time job. And the first two weeks of that job, I felt my soul singing. Not because of the work necessarily, because when you're new, it's not, you know, the work isn't quite as right. exciting. But just that I felt like I was where God needed me to be. And I was trying to do what he needed me to do. Yeah. A few last questions, Kate. Mm -hmm. Do you have a heroine? <clears throat> or am I supposed to say hero? No, is that you are supposed to say hero, yes. <laughs> <clears throat> who, who of all the historical 
personages you've encountered that you most admire or love? It's a very fun question, and there are so many. One is, well, one is still alive. I keep changing in my head who I'll talk about. One is still alive and well, Ardeth Cap. And um, she was on the correlation, when, the Youth Correlation Committee during the 1960s when they were figuring out what correlation would be and what it would mean and how it would radically change the structure of the church. And then she was in a presidency for the young women. And then she was not. And uh, she worked as a consultant for a few years. And then she was made president. So she had this vast experience with the organization and working with the institutional church and consulting and this business experience that then she brought uh, to be Young Women General President. And she, she had such a, she felt during the first weeks that she was president, revelation just pouring down, inspiration pouring down. And she had three different, this notebook for this kind and this for revelation that came while she was studying her scriptures and this for this other kind of, just to record it all. She was a fantastic record keeper, and she donated her materials to the Church History Library. <laughs> uh, but she had to work really carefully to get this vision to happen, because on the heels of correlation, which really emphasized using the priesthood to organize everything, it, it was hard to get these things she felt God had made her a steward over to have happen. And so she was tenacious, she didn't waver in faith in a relationship with God. And she also didn't give up just when things became hard. Almost all of her innovations were hard to make happen. But she kept at it, and, and she would think, well, she even bought a, she bought a fancy technological machine that was something like a VCR that would also, also show slides. And they bought it and figured out how to use it through prayer. They couldn't figure it out. They prayed. <laughs> and then when she'd run into somebody in the lunchroom, or in the garage, who was a decision maker, she'd say, oh, we have this new piece of equipment you should come and see. And in demonstrating the piece of equipment, it was loaded with all of the materials that they wanted, they were trying to achieve for the Young Women program. <laughs> and then when they'd have their chance to present at a meeting of decision makers, some of these men were already familiar with all of this, so they were they really advocated for it and it happened. So it was this really, I, it's, I don't think it's that bad now. <laughs> But this really faithful woman, this really connected woman to God, who was also forgiving and patient with the circumstances that she was in, and she still made things happen. Yeah. I just think she's fantastic. Great. Great. Yeah. Well, is there anything <clears throat> you haven't said that you'd like to about what you think the church could be doing better? I think church members... As, I, as I've studied correlation just recently, my head's really been in this. And, and really, one of the reasons for emphasizing priesthood was that they didn't feel priesthood holders were realizing their potential. It was, it was about getting men to think of home teaching as a sacred contribution, as something that could change the lives of the people around them. Uh, and so I think when... I don't know how to do this to members, but to, to help all of us see there's such an opportunity here to connect with God and make the world more beautiful in the way that we, our individual selves, are specially wired to do. And our lives will be so rich when we're able to do that. Yeah. Uh, I, wish, I wish we could light that fire a little more. And then, and then with women, it's, you know, don't, if relief society, if the relief society, the women's quorum, they used to call it, if the women's quorum you're in isn't accomplishing the things you wish it were, can you find a way? Can you start a little group within it? Can you talk with the leaders in it? And when the answers are no, then then what's the next question? Can you just start something independent of it? Persistence seems to be a theme I'm hearing. Yeah, in your case. well, and you're, you're still, you know, whether you're doing it through your relief society or through your primary or just completely on the side in your neighborhood or with, or with friends or colleagues, you are still a member of that quorum. You yes. are still a member of God's quorum for women, and that that calls you to make the world better. That's a significant term to use in that connection, isn't it? A quorum mm -hmm. of women. Um, it, it, a quorum endowed with power from on high. Yeah. Yeah. Last question today. 
Holy envy. Can you think of another practice or tradition, experience of another faith tradition of which you have holy envy? I, I, I love growing from a very young age, as long as I can remember, I had a sense that Brigham Young had said we should look for truth wherever we can find it. And I loved the 13th article of faith. And those were just guarding stars for me my whole, my whole life. Uh, so there, there's a lot in a lot of traditions. But I remember uh, for one class in divinity school, we were required to attend three different services in different faith communities. And one I went to was a woman. She had a, her name was Debbie Little, and she had a well-paid job, something to do with the law. And she just felt that she should go to divinity school. And so finally she did, and she became ordained an Episcopal priest. And by the end of the ordination process, she realized that her calling was to serve the homeless. And she holds services at Boston Common every Sunday, to noise, all kinds of forms of public transportation and tourists, and it's noisy, noisy, noisy. And people gather there and take the Eucharist, and there's some, there some songs, and they um, exchanged information also about how better to help and support each other. And that service, I went to with some trepidation. At the time, my husband was studying um, to practice in international medicine, and I didn't want to catch tuberculosis. <laughs> and I were, I, you know, sensitive smell. I just, it was, I was a little bit worried about some of these things. And coming home, I ended up shaking hands with a lot of people without homes. And coming home on the train, I felt like my hand was burning with a kind of holiness, that that had been a, a, a vision of Christ's gospel as I'd never practiced or experienced it before. And that I, I wish I were better at, at bringing into my own life on a regular basis, that really just spending time with, with people who have less. Beautiful. Kate, thank you for who you are and the wonderful contributions that you have made and I know will continue to make to the church as a whole. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Terrell. Thank you. Until next time.